Hi everyone, I'm Noah Weiss, and uh, today I'll be talking about the unspoken problems with machine learning and security. I'd like to thank all of you to, for joining me and also to thank ZIFCON for having me. It's a great honor to, to be talking on the conference. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do this off offline. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, a little about me, I'm uh, an AI and machine learning consultant. I've been playing with data for over a decade, uh, both in the industry and academia. I've mostly worked in the risk and cybersecurity domains, uh, which I'm very fond of. Um, and starting PayPal, uh, then uh, uh, I worked as a consultant for startups to help them manage their uh, risk. And uh, lately I worked for Armin's, for those of you who've heard of it. I also, in my spare time, I, uh, I'm a research engineer in the Deep Voice Foundation, where we try to utilize deep learning technique to improve whale research around the world in order to protect and preserve the whale population. I'm also the leader of the Israeli community of uh, women in data science, and I mentor junior data scientists taking their first steps in the field. And uh, last but not least, I'm the proud owner or proud human of uh, those two adorable cats. Say hi. And uh, let's get to it. So the agenda for today. First, since I'm claiming that we do have unspoken problems in machine learning uh, and security, then I'll try to demonstrate that claim. We'll talk about whether the grass really is greener We'll do that by looking at um, machine learning at other domains, where they're at, and then when, where we are at, uh, at security. Then we'll talk about the things that hold us back. What are the causes for machine learning and security not being in the same level as some of the other domains that utilize machine learning? And uh, then about possible solutions, things that I think we can do to change this. So, if we split it up for uh, two, three parts, we basically have the first part where we're talking about are we lagging behind? Uh, once I demonstrate that, whether you believe me or not, we'll talk about why that is the case and uh, then what we can do about it. And just fair warning, the first part is mostly not about security. I'll be showing other domains in order to demonstrate capabilities that uh, the machine learning community was able to get to uh, in those domains. So I know this is a security conference and a security talk. Just bear with me, I promise we'll get there. So are we lagging behind? As promised, let's take a look about machine learning in other visions, in other uh, domains, one of them being computer vision. Uh, computer vision, uh, I assume most of you know, is uh, the domain where uh, basically anything image related is concerned. And the, the model, the, the algorithms try to identify images and perform tasks that have something to do with those images or videos. So computer vision today um, is quite advanced. It has quite a lot of achievements. Uh, I assume most of you have heard of uh, autonomous vehicles and though they're not yet fully operative, mostly for uh, legal reasons and reasons of just um, preparing the market for it. We do have today, um, we have vehicles that are able to drive on their own and though they're not perfect they perform much better than human drivers uh, and that's a pretty amazing achievement at least in my opinion that uh, that's something that we're we were able to get to um, we also have facial recognition uh, which is very good the, the facial recognition technology is uh, quite accurate um, it's not so much used in western countries it's mostly used in china um, I, it's uh, protested by human rights uh, organizations, uh, but if we're just looking at the technology uh, aspect of it, then it is quite um, an impressive achievement, regardless of whether it's used in a, in a way that's, that's moral. 
And then we have uh, generative AI, uh, generative artificial intelligence, which is artificial intelligence or machine learning that creates new images, new videos. Um, we'll take a look at that. So let's take a look at a few examples, as I mentioned, just, just to give you guys a feel, you guys and you gals, a feel of what, uh, what it is that we have in computer vision today. Uh, so first, first example is image completion. Uh, but the algorithm that created uh, what I'm going to show you right now is called uh, image GPT. And it is given uh, an in incomplete image that it has never seen before. And it's asked to complete it in a way that makes sense. So here you can see a few examples for that. On the leftmost column, you have the model input, which means that's the, the half image that the model got. Then on the right hand, basically all of the other columns, except for the most right-hand one, which is the original. Anyway, the middle columns is uh, what, the, it's the model outputs, what the model completed the picture as. And um, you can take a look and you can see what you think. I think it's pretty impressive. Um, and though they're not all winners, for example, we have the uh, water droplet one that doesn't really make sense. Um, they're pretty good. They're pretty good and they're pretty good in uh, rather difficult tasks as well. You can see, for example, how it completed the shadows of the people on the first row in a way that's not trivial. Um, it also, it's able to complete images of things it has never seen before, even as concepts. Um, for example, the elephant with the butterfly wings, well, the butterfly wings ears, um, and it deals with it in a way that uh, seems convincing. Another example we can take a look at is uh, the Gauguin algorithm, uh, which is uh, named after the painter. It's a, a play on words because Gan is uh, the name of uh, that class of algorithms. And uh, what it does is it takes sketches, very, very basic doodles, human doodles, and creates very realistic photos that are based off them. So I put this GIF here just so you can take a look and see uh, how it works. Um, I normally hate GIFs, so we'll move forward quite soon. But you can see how on the left side, what the, the person that drew that did is created a, very, very basic drawing and uh, chose what they wanted it to look like. For example, they uh, drew that brown blob and they chose rock. And um, the algorithm, the model just completes it into a beautiful landscape picture that seems very real. We can see a few more examples, not by GIF. This of uh, a mountain with a river and uh, the forest, and we even have the reflection of all of it in the water, uh, which originally was just a few blobs, again, a few blobs, and the person chose that it, 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 they wanted it to be uh, a mountain, and then water, etc. Here we have a waterfall, quite beautiful. I, I wouldn't mind visiting that. And this, um, this model, this algorithm was for, first created by Catherine Nichols, which is a PhD uh, in Columbia University, which, which is a lie. That is not the case. Um, this person does not exist. And this person is a picture that I took from, it's a photo, a fake photo that I took from the website www.thispersondoesnotexist.com. Um, which basically has um, a model that creates one fictional person after another. You can see a few more examples here. And they all look quite convincing. Uh, you can give it a try yourself after this talk, not during this talk, I'll be, I'll be watching. You can uh, type in and see what, what people you get. Um, 
they, they don't have to be people. Uh, they also have other forms, other uh, fictional things. For example, cats. Uh, if you remember the two cats uh, that I presented in my uh, first slide, the, they're, they don't exist. They're not my cats. I have no cats. Uh, <laughs> they're uh, photos that I took from www.thiscatdoesnotexist.com. And it doesn't stop there. You can get a lot of fictional things by the same basic algorithm, different models based off the same algorithm. Uh, you have www.thispersondoesnotexist.com. You have this cat does not exist. This horse does not exist. This artwork does not exist, which I would say is less convincing just because abstract art in, in its own is sometimes look like something a computer could do. And uh, the most surprising, this chemical does not exist, which basically creates 3D imaging of a molecule. I'm, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know if there's anything there that I should appreciate that the model is able to do. Um, but you can check it out yourself and see what you think. So this was a bit about computer vision and where we are at there, where machine learning research is at um, with computer vision. Let's take a look at another field that's uh, very hot right now, the natural language processing, uh, usually called NLP for short. So natural language processing is, uh, as the name suggests, um, the processing of natural language. It's uh, machine learning trying to, to understand and interpret and work with data that is simply uh, human language. And it has quite um, astonishing achievements. Um, just for example, the fact that we have today pretty good automatic translation is uh, quite incredible. I mean, I don't know how many of you remember what translations, automatic translations used to be like, uh, but any of you who are bilingual can appreciate that an accurate translation or even a semi-accurate translation is very, very hard to get to, um, even if you speak the language. And then uh, having a, a, a model, a computer, um, a script do it is quite impressive. Um, then we also have long form question answering, uh, which basically means that you can type in a question and you would have the model search the web, get the relevant excerpts, the places that talk about that question, and uh, be able to take all of them, integrate them, and provide an answer, provide an answer that summarizes them in a comp comprehensive manner. Um, which is something that a lot of people I know aren't able to do. So it's pretty cool that the model can do that. No, last but definitely not least, we have GPT-3. Um, I, I assume most of you have heard, at least heard the name, but that might be just because I hang around, hang out with uh, other data scientists and machine learning people all the time. Uh, so I, that's my own bubble. Um, let's take a look at what it is. So GPT-3, uh, is a language model, which basically means it's a multi-purpose NLP model. It wasn't trained for what, a specific task. For example, it wasn't trained specifically to translate from English to uh, Hebrew. It wasn't trained to um, find entities in, te in a text or to point out whether the writer of the text is filling a specific sentiment. Uh, it was just trained on language in general and can be used uh, with some fine tuning or no fine tuning at all for a lot of other stuff. And it's mostly generative, usually what it's used for is to generate new text. And it has astonishing performance. Um, don't take my word for it. Let's, let's take a look at a few things that it did. So, one thing, and I'm, I'm really just scraping the top here. I mean, I'll, I'll 
give you guys and gals a few examples, uh, but I really recommend it later, just Google it, uh, perhaps on Twitter, there's a lot of examples for amazing things that people did with GPT-3. Um, so one of those things is generate code. Uh, there is one person that uh, after introducing GPT-3 to examples of GS, uh, sorry, of JSX code, um, got the algorithm to write, generate that code based on just a free text description. And I want to be clear that when I say that they, the person introduced the, the model, I don't mean that they trained, it, trained the model for the task. Um, I won't go into the details right now because it's, it's really not in the scope of that talk, of this talk, but um, that, that's a really big thing, that the model that was not trained at all to create that code was able to take that free text description and generate code, which uh, though I haven't validated it myself, it's something on Twitter, it seems to be pretty good code um, based on a human free text uh, language description of the layout that the, the person input in this wanted. Um, and it doesn't stop there. It also generated machine learning code. Uh, it got a description of a machine learning model and it created a code for that, which uh, is a bit spooky, I'm not gonna lie. I feel like this could be the start of a horror movie, but well, that's where we're at at the moment. And another example that I really liked is um, Someone tried to uh, to give GPT-3 a job interview, basic uh, coding phone, sc phone screen. And uh, as you can see, the person said that uh, though it can't quite pass a coding phone screen, it's getting closer. I'm gonna show you just a few excerpts of the, that that I like. Um, so the human asked, they uh, even saying nice, it said, a response to what the AI previously did. Uh, nice, okay, now write code to remove all the even numbers from an array of numbers. The AI then says, just to clarify, pretty good candidate. Uh, it sounds like I should remove all the elements that are divisible by two. The human says yes, and then provides the, the AI provides the, the code. They, talk, they talk about this some more, and then uh, at a later point, the human says, well, you don't need to do a G sub at all. Try and do it without regular expressions. And the AI understands what that means, and is able to take the code that it previously wrote and then change it to be without regular expressions. Um, it, it does make a mistake there, though, and the human asks, does this, does this code return just the even numbers, or does it remove all the even numbers? The AI says it returns just the even numbers. Again, it understands the question and is able to answer that question based on not only the knowledge and understanding of the question itself, but the context and the code that it previously provided the human with. And then the human says, uh, ah, okay, we wanted to remove all the even numbers rather than returning them. Can you write code for that? And Again, the AI understands that, and it provides different code that does have a syntax error, as the human points out, but it is a code that is, has the same goal as the human requested. And when the human points out that uh, it has a syntax, syntax error, error, then the AI is able to understand that and ask, okay, what, I miss, what am I missing, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can look it up online later to read the rest of it. I found it pretty astounding. Um, for the last example, let's take it. Take a look at Google Duplex. Um, uh, some of you might have already uh, heard it. It's not that new, which is also amazing in itself. Uh, basically, Google created what's supposed to be a personal assistant for phone reservations. Uh, which means that uh, if you want to make uh, an appointment or reservation at one of a few specific uh, business sites, uh, for example, a hair salon or a restaurant, then it's able to call and make that for you. But 
without a person on the other end realizing that they're talking to a machine. Um, they do it, they're, they're able to tackle different obstacles that come up in the conversation and they do it with uh, state of the art natural language processing as well as speech recognition and generation. Um, so let's play the video and uh, just to make sure that you get it, the, the person with the Android sign, with the Google sign is uh, the model. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. They also have a second phone call there, which is uh, kind of amusing. I recommend watching it later. Again, not during my talk. Um, gotta say, that, that model is much better at making phone reservations than I am. Okay, so we talked about machine learning at other domains. Let's talk, let's talk about security. Let's start with the good stuff. Um, so the first is there, there are some significant improvements in malware detection. Uh, most of you have probably heard of uh, the next generation antivirus. It utilizes uh, deep learning techniques. Um, deep learning is a, a subtype of machine learning uh, for malware detection. And it really does quite well. Then there's also some promise for network intrusion detection. Uh, it's not something that's prominent in practice yet. Uh, but it is something to look forward to. However, if we look at the field as a whole, um, most machine learning models in security have so, so, so performance. Um, the machine learning in general also only makes for a small part of the core pro product usually, uh, which makes sense given uh, its abilities. And in general, data and machine learning technology are underutilized in the industry. Uh, we really don't uh, fulfill all of the potential of what we can do with it. Uh, to, sum, to sum up this, uh, this section of the talk, uh, what I say is that uh, we are lagging behind other domains when it comes to machine learning technology. Uh, how we use it and what we're able to get out of it. So we talked about are we lagging behind. Um, I hope you're on the same page with me uh, about that. Now let's talk about why that is the case. So anomaly detection algorithms. Uh, anomaly detection algorithms are algorithms aimed at identifying data points, events, or observations that deviate from data sets normal. Uh, they're very common in security. Um, I would claim they're probably the, the most common type of algorithms to be used uh, in, uh, in security, specifically to identify risky activity, transaction, etc. cetera. Uh, the reason is, first of all, probably because the algorithm just really fits the business needs. Um, it's an algorithm aimed at finding anomalies, and that really helps when we're trying to spot the, the users that shouldn't be there or the permissions that are off or the fraudulent transactions. 
Also, it's unsupervised machine learning, uh, which means that in order to create the model, in order to train it and have a working model, you don't need labels for your data set. Uh, what that means is, um, for example, if, if I'm looking at uh, a set of transactions and I'm trying to spot the fraudulent ones, I don't need to know in advance um, in order to train the model, I don't need to don't know in advance which of uh, the transactions I have in my set are the legitimate transactions and which ones are the fraudulent ones. Despite all that though, um, machine learning algorithms, uh, sorry, anomaly detection algorithms are not ideal for security for a few reasons. <clears throat> First of all, uh, they have a really high false positive rate. Um, a false positive means that the algorithm identified something as an anomaly, or in our case, identified a transaction as fraudulent or user activity as a as malicious activity, uh, when that wasn't actually the case. And that's something that is much more likely to happen when we're talking about security and the kind of uh, tasks we have for our models. The reason is that uh, while if I use um, if I use anomaly detection in, for example, manufacturing, which is a domain that where they use it, uh, if I use it there, then pretty much every anomaly I find is an interesting one. If I want to make sure that every product that comes out of the manufacturing process uh, looks and acts as it should, then every, every anomalous uh, behavior or, t or a characteristic of the product is relevant. However, if we're only trying to find, for example, malicious activity, uh, leg legitimate activity can also be anomalous. So we do have a lot of false positives there. And together with the higher cost of errors than that we have in security, that's really a problem because what are you going to do with it? So um, will we just automatically block every anomaly, which means that we will often block legitimate activity. And that's not really a risk we can usually afford. Uh, and on the other hand, we have to wait for manual review. If we want to make sure that every, anomalous, every anomaly is really risky or malicious before we block it. A human needs to see it and that means that it's both expensive in resources and that it's, it adds a significant delay to, uh, to our system. Another problem with anomaly detection algorithms for security is that since it's unsupervised, the um, so-called ground truth we use for it uh, are human design features. What I mean by that is that when we come to look at our algorithms and, and check if they work like they should, um, the, and also what the, the model trains on, what it um, uh, sets itself and its decision making on, is uh, the features that we designed, the humans, the data scientists or analysts working on the project. And that means, first of all, that it's prone to, very prone to human bias. And it also means that uh, we would usually only spot MOs that we already know, because these are the things that we will look at by, when we design these features. Uh, it's not a deal breaker. That's uh, a lot of times that's the case with uh, machine learning, but it does mean that uh, it, we are limited in some way as long as we use that, that type of algorithm. Another problem we have in um, <laughs> machine learning uh, and security, uh, which is rather a big one, is the change in environment. In other domains, uh, the environment is mostly unchanging. For example, in computer vision, if I have a model that uh, takes an image and says whether it's a dog or a cat, dogs and cats are gonna look pretty much the same. Um, in NLP, working with language, while language evolves, it's a very slow process. Um, it's not something that's likely to significantly change over a few years. However, in security, uh, we have constantly changing environment. We have new devices, we have new applications, new protocols, and 
knew everything basically. Uh, and that is really a problem for a learning model because the model, what the model knows is what it already saw, it's what it, it trained on. And if it wasn't trained on the right uh, data, if it didn't see the right environment when it was trained, when it was created, then it's going to be less accurate in a, in a new environment. Another problem is an adapting adversary. That is a serious challenge for us. Uh, as we become better at securing our devices and our networks, the attackers on the other end become better at outsmarting our defenses. Um, that, this is not a new challenge that we face with, uh, but it's a problem that's uncommon in most fields. <coughs> for example, in computer vision, um, it's not only that cats and dogs stay pretty much the same, uh, they also don't try to outsmart us and look different in the exact ways uh, that would fool our models. Um, same with NLP, language doesn't change specifically in a way that would trick GPT-3. Um, it, we have on the other end, on the other end, the uh, the people creating what we're trying to identify are able to uh, specifically aim and change their behavior and their tactics in a way that would fool our, our algorithms. Then we have tagging. Um, just mentioning again, when I say tagging, I mean getting labels for a data set. Uh, I gave the, the example with the fraudulent transactions earlier. Another option is uh, if we're looking at the network, activity, network activity, if I'm monitoring a computer network and I want to spot malicious activity, it means being able to say on each activity that I'm looking at if uh, it was legitimate or malicious. So when we're talking about computer vision NLP, it's much easier to get tagged data sets. Uh, one reason is uh, that there are often public data sets that are already created and shared. I'll, I'll get more to that later. But in general, it's just they're out there. Um, if I want a data set of cats, I can pretty much search Google for cats, uh, and most of it would be accurate. I can also use crowdsourcing. I can uh, use platforms like Mechanical Turk, and just give give my images to people everywhere to tag. Uh, if we're talking about NLP, the the tag data sets are basically out there because it's based on language. So I can just work on random tweets for tweet from Twitter. I can download Wikipedia and train my model on that. Uh, I have plenty of data, and all of it is already tagged. And in security, we can't really do that. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, the first is expertise. Uh, we do need to really know uh, security in our domain in order to say whether an activity is malicious or whether this is a malware or a legitimate application. We can't just put it on Mechanical Turk and ask people to do that. We also need context. While a picture of a dog remains a picture of a dog regardless of context, if I'm looking at activities and I'm trying to define if they're legitimate or malicious, I really need to know the context I'm, ta I'm talking about. Which computer network was it? What do users do there? What it usually looks like? <clears throat> then there's also the problem of confidentiality. Uh, we provide services for other people, for other companies, and we need to keep the, their data confidential. We can't just outsource everything uh, or putting online for crowdsourcing, etc. And there's also the problem of scale. Uh, if we're talking about things like monitoring, monitoring um, networks, for example, that's a lot of data in very short time. And inside that data, we only have a small part that is actually malicious. That's uh, an interesting uh, activity, an interesting part of the data. Um, so we need to go through quite a lot of our big data sets in order to get something that we can work with. 
And the bigger data sets do mean bigger tagging problem. You can't just take uh, a subsample, for example, and work with it. Because as I mentioned before, only a small, small part will be uh, the, the part that we're at, we actually want the model to be able to recognize. Um, this also brings me to the, to the next problem, which is imbalanced classes. Imbalanced classes uh, is what we, we call the problem where different classes in the data are extremely over or underrepresented. Um, for example, if you look at the image, uh, let's say that uh, one is uh, legitimate transactions and two would be fraudulent transactions. Uh, that image is even a much better case than what you usually have. Usually, it, we would only have a fraction, a tiny fraction uh, of the data being malicious activity, the activity we're trying to spot. And that's really a problem because machine learning models are basically all of the, the, statistic, the statistics behind it and the, the math behind it relies on classes to be pretty much the same. Uh, they don't have to be exactly equal, but uh, extremely imbalanced data sets uh, mostly result in poor predictive performance of the model, especially for the minority class or classes, which are the ones that we're trying to spot. This is a major problem when we're aiming to identify fraud, fraud or attacks or malware or anything of the sort. And while there are some common solutions, they are limited and do not fully solve this problem. Um, we, I don't want to go into, into the solutions too much, just uh, basically we, we can oversample or undersample, we can create synthetic data. There are methods to deal with that, but they're just not as good as having the actual data. Another thing that we have uh, in our characteristic of security that's different from other domains, um, we, we have a very, uh, very high need for explainability. And while it's not unique to security, it is something that sets apart from most domains. Um, the reason that that's important is that uh, everything I showed you basically in computer vision or NLP is based on deep learning techniques. Deep learning, I mentioned it earlier, it's a subtype uh, of machine learning. It's based on artificial neural networks. It's uh, very computationally expensive. Those are models that are very hard to train. They require a lot of data and a lot of resources, but they, they get quite astounding results. So a lot of the uh, cutting edge technology and achievements that the machine learning world was able to get to was based on deep learning techniques. <clears throat> and the problem with the deep learning techniques is that they are considered black boxes. We don't really have an explanation for the, why the model uh, chose what it chose, why it decided what it decided for the output, basically. And in security, we really need explainability. Uh, if I'm going to block this user activity, I need to be able to say why. Even if I'm not blocking it automatically, but I'm asking an analyst to review it and take the decision. It's much harder for the analyst to do that if they don't know what was the reason this activity was spotted in the first place. And again, well, we do have that in other fields. For example, uh, a lot of the machine learning in, in the health domain has a, a similar problem, not, not exactly the same because they don't have, they don't need to uh, respond so quickly. Um, it is mostly prominent in uh, security from what I see. Now, this is not a deal breaker. Uh, deep learning could still be used. We've added on explainability models. Uh, the, it's a rather new field, uh, the, the, the whole, area of trying to explain deep learning in retrospect. Um, so there are some solutions, but they are far from perfect and they're very complex to apply. So it makes sense that it will not be the go-to option for most data science and machine learning teams. Another problem we have is confidentiality. I mentioned it a bit earlier when talking about tagged data sets. And if we compare this to other domains, um, 
one of the main uh, things that really allowed, for example, computer vision and NLP to get to where they are today is the fact that a lot of the data sets are public. And that really allows having public uh, baselines or benchmarks. Um, it basically means that when I have uh, a new algorithm or a new method that I tried, I want to share it with the world, I can test it on data sets that are, that, that are already known to other people in my field. And I can show that uh, my model really re reached a better score or didn't. And then I know that it's maybe not as good. And it's a way to really share your work and create an active and a fruitful discussion on different ways to approach a problem. Uh, also, uh, other fields, mostly computer vision and NLP, have publicly released trained models. Uh, for example, GPT-3 that I showed you earlier, uh, it was created by OpenAI, which has a lot of funding and worked on it for quite a lot uh, with a lot of resources. And then it was, well, partially published, but published for the rest of the world to use. Uh, it's the same with a lot of uh, uh, the most famous NLP models, such as BERT. Or, I won't go into name, names because it's probably not relevant for most of you. But this really helps basically the entire machine learning community to utilize and, and use in their work the products of other people's work that they are willing to share with the world. And all of those things enable not only direct collaboration, collaboration but also uh, a way to compare new methods and algorithms, as I mentioned earlier. On the other hand, in security, uh, we are bound by confidentiality. Uh, we can't just share everything that we have. And uh, unlike other domains which might have like, that same problem, we also don't have any natively public data available. Um, for example, say that I'm providing uh, services to your construction, construction, construction companies uh, and that uh, I take uh, pictures of construction sites and uh, use that to estimate the, the current status of the project. So in that case as well, I'm bound by confidentiality. I won't just take that data and share it with the world, but I can get different data to work on. In general, pictures of construction sites are things that are achievable. And on the other, uh, on the other side, uh, what we have in security is, uh, again, if I'm talking about uh, tr fraudulent transactions, there aren't just, there isn't transa transaction data just out there in the wild. Um, same about monitoring computer networks. Uh, specifically, malware is some, somewhere, something that uh, is more available, and maybe that's also part of why we're able to make much better progress in this field but mostly the data is not out there uh, and it's not something that we can share. There are a few publicly available data sets. Uh, I do want to mention that, uh, but there are few, they are small and they're outdated. So it's not really something we can uh, base our work on. And I want to share with you a quote uh, in, uh, in a paper that reviewed uh, current machine and deep learning techniques in the security industry. Many researchers are struggling to find comprehensive and valid data sets to test and evaluate their proposed techniques. And having su a suitable data set is a significant challenge in itself. In order to test the efficiency of such mechanisms, Reliable data sets are needed that, one, contain both benign and several attacks, two, meet real world criteria, and three, are publicly available. Again, that is a real problem that really limits our ability to cooperate uh, in order to move forward with this technology. So we discussed the first two sections. We talked about uh, are we lagging behind? We talked about why. 
we are lagging behind. And let's talk about what we can do. So the first thing that we can do, in my opinion, uh, to help move ourselves forward is public data sets. If we have those, it will really, really help us cooper cooperate on stuff, even not directly, and really create a more active discussion that we can use to, to improve our algorithms, our models, our methods. That would also allow us to have benchmarks, uh, which again is a, an excellent and necessary way to compare new algorithms, not only within the same comp company. And the way to get to those two first steps, in my opinion, is having direct collaboration between different security companies for that goal. Um, having companies come together in order to create those data sets uh, and share them with the world and then really create that base that we need, that uh, most ba uh, basic layer that we need in order to create everything else on top of that. I think that would really help push us forward. In general, those, all those three steps would allow us to encourage an active discussion and uh, indirect as well as direct collaboration in the public domain, resulting in faster, better progress for the security domain as a whole. To wrap things up, we talked about uh, are we lagging behind? I showed you examples of what we can do with computer vision and uh, natural language processing. Um, again, those are just a few examples just to get you the general sense. Uh, of course, it's harder to uh, really compare when we're not talk talking numbers, but since uh, those are very different domains with different tasks and different data, uh, it's hard to, it, it's not something we can really do compare numbers. Um, so I hope that you get the general gist of it. Uh, and so we talked about how machine learning is lagging behind, how we're not really where other domains are with machine learning. And then we talked about why that is the case. We talked about a few problems, a few challenges that we have in getting where we might maybe could be about anomaly detection algorithms and why though they're used quite a lot in the industry, why they're, they might not be ideal. Talked about the problems of tagging, of the changing environment, of the adapting adversary, um, some other things that are relevant. And uh, last but not least, we talk about what we can do. Uh, those are my own suggestion, suggestions and opinions. Um, I would love to hear if any of you have any more suggestions or opinions uh, or questions or things that you don't agree with. And uh, if you do, you can contact me in uh, any of the, <laughs> the ways that appear on your screen right now. Um, I'm, my Twitter handle or my LinkedIn page is probably the best way to create an active discussion. I would really love if this talk could be the small start of uh, talking more about this issue and how we can change it for the better. So whether what you have, whether you agree with me or especially if you don't, whether you have any more questions or even if you'd like uh, my references, uh, I have quite a lot of uh, papers that I read on the subject and also I can share the link for the amazing Google Duplex demo or to some of the ways to see what GPT-3 can do. Uh, for any of that, feel free to contact me. I'd like to thank all of you for being with me and listening to me ramble about some of my favorite subjects. Uh, I hope that you feel that you've learned something. I hope you feel that, uh, that my talk contributed in some way. Um, if, if you do, I would love for you to share, I'd love for you to share it with some of your colleagues because this is really a message that I would love to see get out there and talked about more. And uh, thanks again to Zeef Khan for having me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.